Welcome to today's webinar. This webinar will be going over cases from the clinic, managing the care of patients who are highly treatment experienced with limited treatment options. I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Carrie Johnston from Wild Cornell Medicine. Hello, welcome. I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar um, and thank you in advance for your attention at this important topic. Um, I'll introduce myself. I am a recent graduate of our fellowship program here at Weill Cornell. I'm now an instructor of medicine um, and I'm actually currently in our outpatient HIV practice um, where I have a panel of patients. Helping and our expert top um, expert opinions for this conference today include Dr. Monica Gandhi from UCSF. We have Dr. Michael Sag from University of Alabama and Dr. Paul Sachs um, from Harvard. So welcome to all of our panelists and I look forward to a great discussion today. The objectives for our session today um, include describing the diagnostic and therapeutic approaches to treating patients who are highly treatment experienced, including individuals on complex antiretroviral therapy regimens, those with limited treatment options, uh, patients with poor adherence to visits and medications, individuals actively using methamphetamine, um, or who have difficulty taking pills. The CME information is listed here. Um, this also should be available in an email. And this course has been approved for CME credits. Um, again, I believe there's more information on this if you wish to claim them in the email. Um, there are various supporters for this webinar. Um, so thank you to all of the support. To navigate the webinar, um, you'll see that poll questions will be posed to the audience throughout the session. A separate window will show these poll questions and you can choose your response uh, from the options listed. After the poll closes, the responses will be displayed um, so we can see what everyone's thinking to these challenging questions. If you'd like to ask questions of the presenters, you can use the Q&A button. Um, your first and last name should be indicated and then you can pose your question. I'll help moderate um, in real time as much as possible as these questions come in. Finally, this is an example of using the poll. So we're trying to understand our audience's preference. Um, you should just have a poll question pop up. So if you don't mind, just answer the question. If this webinar had been scheduled for, for yesterday, um, which was a holiday here in the US for President's Day, would you have attended? And you can indicate yes, no, yes, maybe no, or it, or it doesn't matter to you. So click one and then submit. All right, thank you very much. Okay, great. So the poll is working and we can see the results to this question. All right, well, without further ado, we'll get started, thank you. Great. Uh, so Dr. Gandhi is having trouble, I think, with her video, but she is here and we will hear her. I'm going to, there she is. Um, and we're going to go through a series of cases. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and let's blow that up. Okay. There's two pretest questions. So this one is a uh, question that says, based on CDEX data, among highly treatment experienced patients followed up in clinics over the last few year, what proportion have limited treatment options? That means fewer than two active drugs that could be in their regimen. Go ahead and vote. Okay. All right. And you'll be seeing this question again later uh, after the course, you'll be mailed this and this will be important with your CME information. So we'll bookmark this. It looked like it was a roughly even spread across all the choices. Um, and then um, a little bit of a long stem here, but in the setting of virologic failure, we need to confirm the viral load is greater than 200. Um, and then you have a discussion about adherence. And on the day that the confirmation viral load is obtained, oftentimes a resistance test is, is uh, obtained. And once that viral load is confirmed to be elevated and resistance is turned, you can create a new regimen. Which of the following 
is the recommended number of fully active drugs that should be included in the new regimen um, for someone with confirmed virologic failure. Uh, let's go ahead and vote. While it snows in Alabama. And nobody drives because if they say they don't know how to drive on snow, the, if, if the roads are icy, nobody can drive on ice. <laughs> Okay, so we're split evenly between two and three, and we will talk about this. So let's go ahead and we'll move on to our uh, questions and cases. There's about four or five cases. The first one's kind of quick. Um, and I always set it up with so that everybody's oriented to what topic we're engaged. The question here is, what do I do with a patient who has persistently detectable viremia? So this is a 55-year-old was diagnosed 18 years ago with HIV. Initial viral load was very high with a low CD4 count, and currently his HIV RNA is 85, and it's been bouncing between um, 60 and 100 for the last several years. Um, CD4 counts 525 now. He started on nelfinavir, uh, D4T, and 3TC, which kind of dates the, the patient's experience, has been through a number of regimens, but right now is on dolutegravir, boosted darunavir, and, and 3TC. No historical resistance tests are available. The question is, would you change therapy at this time? Yes, no, not sure. <laughs> If anybody wants to answer my uh, uh, phone, it was a uh, uh, spam. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So 60% said no. Carrie, what would you do with this? I, I agree. I actually think this is a great question. And in our era of patients having access to many and often all of their medical records, people will come to me sometimes and say, well, you know, my viral load, it used to be undetectable. Now it's 80, now it's 90. And, and I think that it almost can be troubling to someone who's been told that their viral load has always been undetectable. And our very sensitive assays nowadays really can detect down to very low levels. And, you know, both how we frame that conversation and then thinking of the science behind it is important. Um, I, would, I would not change the medication regimen as long as they had been, you know, if I thought of this kind of as a blip and try to then explain that concept. Dr. Gandhi. I don't love it. Um, <laughs> I don't love the uh, viral load of 85. Um, there are some studies that show low-grade viremia uh, have a higher risk of ultimate virologic failure. It is a situation in which um, resistance can evolve. And yes, we have highly more sensitive assays and certainly the U equals U studies, um, at least for prevention, you have to be less than 200. So it's good for prevention, but it, to me, it heralds that he could, um, with the issues with adherence could be evolving low level resistance. I do not love it. I, I always am very concerned and I think about blips really hard. Sure. He's been, he's been like this though for years. I mean, this yeah. is, and it's not going up. So Paul, how would you interpret all this? Are, are you nervous or what do you think? So I, I agree with what, what Monica said about the fact that low level viremia can be a predictor of worse, ultimate worse outcome, but that doesn't mean we know what to do with it. And I think that the, the data are looking like these patients with persistent low level viremia have this thing called repliclones, which are basically non-replicating virus that's being uh, uh, expressed from latently infected cells that are detectable in our viral load assays. And they typically are people with very, very high baseline viral loads like this gentleman. And so I don't know that switching his regimen is going to help this. In fact, I doubt it will. In fact, most of the studies of these patients show that when you mess around with the regimen, nothing happens. So I'd be you know, really scrutinizing the his history to see, does he have resistance? That means that he could simplify, simplify his regimen or not. And I would not change solely to get to the low level of viremia. Right, I started off with this case because it, it's hard to distinguish sometimes what's virologic failure and what isn't. And typically, uh, as Monica said, you know, above 200 is when you get worried about U equals U. You also get worried about ongoing replication. And this is a slide 
really from the late middle to late 90s, believe it or not, um, when viral dynamics were being discussed. And antiretroviral therapy, all it does is prevent an uninfected activated T cell from becoming infected in this vicious cycle. So the real question here is, is the regimen failing? Is, is, it, is there sort of low level infection that's happening? If it, and if it's true, then you would expect that resistance would emerge as, as Monica said, and, but then you'd also maybe see the viral load increasing. Getting to what Paul said, these cells on average, the one in the center here, once they're infected, live on average of about a day and then they're, they're, they either die or killed off. But there is this latent pool, the reservoir, if you will, of cells that live for a long, long time. And the concept is that people that have had a really high initial viral load at baseline before they ever got on treatment, this guy was almost a million, typically have a larger pool of these cells and it's spitting out virus, but not replicating virus, just that you can actually detect. And so the, the important distinction is, do we believe, and that's probably the operative word, in this case, that there's a, a lesion here in the antiretroviral therapy where you would want to change, or is this simply coming out? And in my view, in this particular case, since it's been this way for years, it feels pretty likely that this is a situation and you can change regimens, but if it's blocking 100%, you can't do any better than that. And my bet is if we changed him to something else, it would pretty much stay the same. Um, Dr. Gandhi very accurately um, described these data that all cause mortality for those people who have low level viremia, even if it's because of the situation just described, there's an association with a higher relative risk of mortality over time, but not nearly what you see with high level viremia uh, in either situation. So um, ideally less than 50, or as Carrie said, you wanna get it as low as you can, but I think sometimes that's beyond our control. And maybe this is just an epiphenomena where the people who happen to have had high level viremia to begin with, lots of reservoir, leaky virus, if you will, um, appear to be at higher risk, but I don't know if there's much we can do. Comments? I agree question. there's not much I can do, but I don't like it. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, um, but the other thing I wanted to say is that, um, I, I totally agree, and, and it makes uh, patients nervous to see this because they get um, the viral load assay, depending on what it is, 20, 40, uh, 80, uh, they will see that report. And it's the same thing with detectable, but less than the assay. But you're right that, um, I, I, I agree, there's probably, we just watch carefully. So I had a, a colleague, famous, famous HIV doctor, in Boston, who used to order the less sensitive assays intentionally? Well, yeah. You know, he basically said, "I don't, I don't want to know about it." So. <laughs> well, maybe that's a good strategy. Um, this is a this is a slide. Now we're transitioning to um, what is limited treatment options, and that's fewer than two active regimen. Which, by the way, is the answer to the first question. So, a second question: You really want? Um, at least two active red, active drugs, and that's been in the guidelines for over 20 years, and it's it's just a fundamental principle. Um, but look look at this; it's really interesting. These are data from CNEX, and you can see that from 2000 to 2006, of the entire population of patients that were seen in our clinics, there was about six to eight percent who were in that situation where there wasn't much to add. And then around 2007, coincident with a brand new class of drugs, integrase inhibitors, this dropped. And as the integrase inhibitors came into more widespread use, that number is now less than 0.8%. So my question, this is, so that's the answer to that first question, which was spread around. So 0.8% for the last several years, and it seems to be drifting down further. And this, um, this paper is now out in AIDS from back in November, but it really was, um, Mari Kitahata, Heidi Crane did a great job with this using the Stanford database and, and resistance mutations on all the CNICS patients who experienced virologic failure. And this is what they found. Does this have face validity? Do, do you guys, does that sound about right that less than one out of a hundred of your patients are in this situation? Definitely. 
really lucky time to be in, I think, since yeah. uh, integration inhibitors. And then even beyond that with Dronuvir Ritonavir as our, I mean, 2008 was this great year for me, which was Travarine, um, Dronuvir Ritonavir, and, uh, and the first integrase inhibitor, 2007, 2008, good times. Because we, between those, we have a lot of options. Now we have Fostemsevir if we really must. And we're gonna talk about that. Carrie, does this, this has face validity with you? It certainly does. I mean, I think kind of starting quote unquote, my clinical practice, even within the past four years or so, you know, I didn't ever experience those times of the late nineties, early two thousands when resistance seems like it was a massive challenge and it still is, but seemingly in fewer cases. So I agree with all of that. We actually had a comment in the Q and A, someone was clapping for this slide. So I think there's a lot of support for these medications. Yeah. So this is a whole mantra or purpose or mission of this session is to talk about the patients who still exist, but in much lower numbers. And for folks, Carrie, like you and a whole generation of providers who came along after 2007 into practice, it's hard to know what to do with these patients because at least for us older folks, um, we've been at this a while and saw those bad days. Um, so let's move on to the to the cases. Oh, this is a fascinating thing. The this in the blue line are people who did not have limited treatment options and their virologic success. Look at what happened with the integrase inhibitors. Despite the fact that people had limited treatment options, when you put them on an integrase inhibitor, in general, they did well. And so that was a surprising finding in, in the study. Um, following them up after they had. Now, in fairness, if once LTO, once limited, they were always, so, you know, things change. But so, but anyway, I thought that was interesting. So oh, let's move on. Yeah. I mean, the, the one, one reason for that is that some of our most resistant patients back in the pre-Raltegravir era were the most adherent. They had had serial monotherapy. They always did what they were told. They they, they had very longstanding HIV infection. And so they ended up uh, with incredible resistance. And then once they had effective medications, they applied that adherence to these new drugs and they was they became suppressed almost immediately. Much better tolerated in general. Yeah. Too. Yeah. It makes it even better. And I mean, I think I can remember cases back from the 90s where people are on D4T or DDI and they were so adherent that even though they were developing lactic acidosis syndrome, they kept taking their medicine every day, even though it made them feel horrible. So yeah. yes, adherence was not the issue. But I think in today's world, it is, as we're going to hear about in all these cases. So one of a, com a common question is, can I simplify a regimen for somebody who previously was lim had limited treatment options, but now has success? So, and I thank our other panelists for these cases. Um, this is a 68 year old who had HIV for 20 years. A current regimen is darunavir that's boosted twice a day. TAF FTC is a single comp, uh, tablet and dolutegravir. Uh, up until 2015, uh, this patient had poor adherence, uh, but since then his viral load has been suppressed. Um, a remote genotype and phenotype is available, but there is an incomplete history. So you're basically flying blind um, on this case. So the question then, oh, sorry, here is a former geno uh, phenotype. This was, um, Dr. Sachs can comment on where this location is. Yes, uh, this is, you know, you know that, that this is a genotype phenotype combination assay. Uh, and uh, I've, I've noted before that these are most commonly sent from the state of California to a lab in California that does them. <laughs> so uh, we, we hardly ever send phenotypes in, in Massachusetts. But anyway, what it shows, you want me to interpret it or no? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so he this person has um, five out of the six thymine and associated mutations and has, uh, so that's 41, 67, 70, 215, and 219, has the mutation of didanosine abacavir, L74V, uh, and has the M184V mutation. And what this basically means is that the NRTIs are all impaired. Uh, the only one that might have some residual activity is tenofovir, but we all know that the NRTIs 
continue to have some activity, even with high, high level resistance. And then it has extensive, extensive uh, NNRTI resistance and probably resistance to deraverine, although it's not on this particular. Uh, I would take these mutations and throw them into the Stanford database to see whether deraverine's activity is predicted, but I doubt it. Yeah. And one if of the I could just say one thing please, about please, that. Please. Um, so like you said, the, the phenotype is being predicted from the genotype on this particular study and I, or the, this particular assay. And I like to just look at the mutations and ignore the predicted phenotype because you can hopefully do that yourself. And the thing about the deraverine, because I think deraverine is coming up as the NNRTI that we can plug in not really for, I mean, we're not using it for first line therapy, but we are using it, not, not much. Um, and that may come up with weight gain and whatnot, but we're not really, though it was studied as naive therapy, we're thinking about it sometimes in salvage because it is the NNRTI that's um, good with hepatic and renal insufficiency, good with food, um, and it doesn't have as many drug-drug interactions. And so the way I think of deraverine resistance is not putting it in the database um, only because there's not that much experience about it, but looking at the drive forward, drive ahead trials and seeing what people failed with, because these are essentially trials where you have a low genetic barrier resistance class and an RTIs, and there will be people who fail and they will come out with mutations. And there were essentially five mutations that came out as predictive of uh, failing on deraverine and H221Y was one of them. And I actually put on my contacts a friend named Deraverine, and then <laughs> I have those five in there, and then I can always. <laughs> but this one has. It's very several. helpful. I do that with Darunavir too. Right, but this one has this particular genotype has several of those friends, if you will, or maybe they're enemies. We call them, right? The, uh, we can call them enemies. The ones that are most likely, though, right, are the 188, um, which is actually. So yeah, I, I can certainly show 188 is every NNRTI is gone. And that's why HIV2 is resistant to NNRTIs yes. because of the 188 mutation. But this doesn't have 188, I'm so sorry. Well, and so it's just the 221. Yeah, but what that's about most predictive why, in this? Why 181C combined with G190A and that type of thing? I, you know, just what came out again with the drive ahead and drive forwards was yeah. not the G190 and the one, uh, the one okay. one. I, I would not rely on Dereverine for this. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. But, yeah. but it's how I think of it when I need to use it. Okay, so that's helpful. Um, and these are the PIs. Um, looks like a lot of badness here. Um, some partial susceptibility. Uh, I think the thing to remember in, in looking at phenotypes Genotypes on PIs in particular are difficult um, because you see there's a lot of bad resistance mutations here. The phenotype is more, oops, is more like a sliding scale. Um, whereas the NRTI is not terribly helpful. We didn't spend much time on that, but um, they, they can show a lot of resistance on phenotype, but the genotype is more helpful. Uh, comments? Again, here I have my, you know, what what came out with Darunavir in the essentially the really the power trials, the Titan trials, what came out when you had a lot of experience and then it failed with Darunavir. And there are 11 Darunavir associated mutations that I keep in my phone um, and under the contact Darunavir and five of them um, are here. So this is yeah. five Darunavir associated mutations. Sure. Like you said, it actually doesn't mean that it doesn't have partial activity, but it would be not doing BID here is pretty much impossible. So if you're it would be hard to call Darunavir a fully active drug. In this right, case. and it has to be BID with this many mutations. Mm. And, and in the interest of time, I'm, I'm gonna go, but I wanted to come back to this. Um, any comment on the fact that the bar, if you will, for tenofovir is in the hyper susceptible range? Does that help or is that nonsense? It's the 184V effect. And so it's, Right. So the 184V is what makes these guys go off the map. And it also has a sort of reverse, at least in this assay, effect where you see that the normal range of susceptibility is in here. And this is to the left of it, which means that um, uh, it's kind of the Bernie Sanders effect of going left of, of the midline here. Wearing mittens. 
<laughs> All right, here we go. So, so many with that discussion, though. let's see what, the, I mean, sometimes I'll just jump to this, but I, I thought it was important to have the discussion and interpretation of the genotype. So let's go ahead and vote. Would you keep him on his current regimen or her current regimen? Would you just simplify and drop the darunavir or would you go to some other option because single dose therapy might be preferred as opposed to two pills? Some other option, go ahead and vote. If we, uh, Jose, can we bring up the, the voting panel? There we go. So you can see them here. Number one is current regimen. Two is two and three are drop the darunavir and either go with a single tablet, big tegravir is option three, or go with um, just dropping darunavir or some other option, which is four. Yeah, there are some great questions in the chat and one just came in about concerns for integrase resistance in this setting. Okay, so we're gonna to try to prevent that. So the poll says mostly it's a George Herbert Walker Bush, not gonna change, wouldn't be prudent. Um, so, and there's a, a plurality who are really in favor of doing something different uh, with, with just dropping Darunavir. Panel, what, what do you think? And I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase it that the patient is asking for this. The patient says, I don't like this twice daily Darunavir. Is it, is it doing anything or not? So there, there's, I, I'm going to say that, that there was a kind of neat looking, neat little study uh, that Charlotte Page Roll from uh, form, former Brigham resident and uh, Emory ID fellow just published uh, looking at people who are on twice daily Darunavir and suppressed and switching them to once daily darunavir in clinical practice. And uh, what you found was that they all stayed suppressed. And that's probably because there is some residual activity uh, that the trough concentrations at once daily darunavir is actually not so terrible. And that if you have enough supporting other drugs and here you've got dolutegravir, which is super active and partial activity of NRTIs, you probably can get away with it. I'm not sure I would in this case, because my, you know, this guy, this person has the, uh, 54M and 33F mutations, which are major mutations for Grunavir, so I, it would be gutsy. And another thing you could do is uh, just if you wanted to really kind of is is well no that wouldn't that wouldn't simplify but you could can I ask you something about that Paul was it Grunavir Ritonavir once a day or is it Grunavir Kobe once a day in the um, in the Charlotte Rolls uh, study because I don't remember. The, the reason I would ask is mm -hmm. this sort of darunavir Kobe at the end of the dosing interval likely has a lower darunavir mm -hmm. trough than darunavir ritonavir even once a day, 800, 100. So I've been reluctant to do darunavir Kobe, but with, like you said, with five, I know that was a long time ago, but it, I, I stared at that PK curve a lot. Um, but I, I think I agree with you with five darunavir ritonavir mutations. We can interpret the Odin study all we want, but it was usually three that you could maybe get away with one, but I think with five, it's hard. Um, so my concern with this is that if you just put them on, that two and three are the same. You have a unfettered, I'm sure fully active integrase inhibitor because you didn't give us any history that he had had integrase inhibitor experience, but you have one integrase inhibitor with partially active tenofovir, and that's pretty much it. And um, you're not protecting your BIC or your dolotegravir. BIC tegravir this year is coming out with, if you have an M184B and keeping it unprotected, it can evolve resistance. Dolotegravir, we knew from um, the Donning study that we needed some more protection than partial activity of TAF. It's why people were on AZT um, with, uh, in, in Donning. And so I am worried about not protecting. I'm worried about two and three. One is clearly protecting because he's been suppressed this entire time. Doesn't mean you have to use darunavir or tonavir. You could use postemsevir, which is BID and only one pill instead of like darunavir or tonavir is four pills, right? 600, 100 BID, that's four pills over the day. Postemsevir is two pills over the day. You could probably make it fewer pill burden, but I would not not protect, not not protect my NST. <laughs> So don't 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 lower your flank to protect your integrase inhibitor. So um, I, I, I hadn't I wasn't aware of those data, Paul. But I mean, so one option in the number four category might be 
make it a little easier on them, drop the twice a day to Runavir. No? Monica's not happy with that decision. I'm not happy. I'm so nervous yeah, about She that. wasn't happy with the first case either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm more Monica, nervous. This is, this I, came, I'm more nervous. So you've been outed because of the availability of a phenotype. So this came from your center. What did you guys do? Do you remember? This... Um, so, uh, I think some people kept them on one and then some people kept them on change to fostemsevir because it's BID, also few drug-drug interactions, and that took four pills to two, and then that's one, two, three pills, once, a, three pills once a day and one at night. The, the other issue is he's 68 and darunavir is associated, probably associated with increased cardiovascular risk. We, we obviously don't have those, any data like that for fostemsevir since it's so rarely used, but there's reason to think that it wouldn't have the same yeah. association. So Carrie, you're listening to all this and uh, this, uh, this type of thing comes up in your practice, I know as well. So what are you gleaning from all this discussion? I actually was thinking it's very interesting mentioning the age of this patient, 68. And I would anticipate he probably has a lot of other comorbidities. Um, so thinking about how to manage polypharmacy in this setting, especially with a pharmacologic booster is gonna be really important. I know we're dedicating some slides later on to fostemsevir, but I think that this is another um, really good reason to think, okay, how can we reduce pill burden and minimize drug-drug interactions and optimize cardiac outcomes where we have those data? Yeah. So the answer isn't crystal clear, right? And that's the point of the exercise that we're faced with this kind of not commonly, but enough where everyone I'm sure watching is nodding their head. Yeah, I've had a case like this or something similar. And the agony literally of going through the decision-making is really what we're highlighting here. And if you take nothing away from this more than the principle that the two active drugs are essential, the integrase inhibitor, basically, I think we all agree, if you lose that, this is, that's a really bad situation. So we got to protect that. And we're balancing that against the patient's desire to simplify. And maybe he's doing that or she's doing that on their own by skipping their afternoon darunavir dose. We don't know. That happens. Mm -hmm. um, but but fostemsevir might be an option here, staying the same. If, if you interpret that phenotype and say there's hyper susceptibility to TAF, then you still would have two drugs with the uh, dolutegravir and TAF, but the data are suggesting that that doesn't hold up as much as we would imagine it to. So um, I think the conclusion is option one or option four seems to be the consensus of the panel. Is that fair? Option four with Fostemsevir. Yeah. Yeah. With, yeah. with, with the caveat that it's really been barely used in yeah. that capacity. And we're going to come so, back to more details on that a little bit later. And so, I think there was a really good question about darunavir Kobe twice a day, but it's just too much darunavir likely with that 800 BID. Um, yeah. So it would have been a lower pill burden, but we just don't, it's too much Kobe and too much darunavir. Yeah. All right. So again, I think the thesis of this, the whole exercise is these are tough cases and sometimes the answers aren't straightforward or, it's basically everybody feels each other's pain as we as we go through this kind of thing. On All the right. other hand, he's been suppressed and he's doing a great job. Oh, well, good. So something went well so far. <laughs> um, so here's another setting. So a virologic failure due to poor adherence to both visits and medication. And I might add that visit adherence is really an important metric that we should pay attention to, in my opinion. Um, what that means is that somebody had a scheduled appointment and simply didn't show. They didn't call it a cancel. They just didn't show. And that's a metric that actually even one missed visit is associated uh, with, a, with a relative risk of mortality going up. And frequent missed visits, it goes up incrementally from there. So missed visits is something to track. And it often means or is associated with poor medication adherence. So this person has both. So complicated STEM, I'll try to go through it quickly. 41-year-old man who um, diagnosed with HIV in 2010, initial viral load was 160,000, CD4 65, had wild-type virus, 
B5701 negative, started on a Favarin's based uh, single tablet regimen, did well um, until about January 2019, stopped using um, the Favarin's and started using crystal meth. And again, I can imagine everyone nodding their head. Yeah, I've, I've got at least several of these types of situations that I try to manage. So the meth continued um, into November, um, intermittent uh, taking medicines uh, got started on Vic Tegravir single tablet regimen, and again, had poor visit and medication adherence for the next year, and now shows up with a detectable viral load of over 200, a CD4 count of 318, and had the following mutations there, uh, the 103M184VP225H, only one protease, which uh, we'll talk about in a second, but had a couple of integrase inhibitor resistance uh, mutations. So um, let's pause and before we vote, sorry. Um, well, you can vote as we talk. Um, anybody wanna uh, take a shot at the interpretation of the genotype phenotype? What we have is obviously the standard Favarin's mutation, um, and we've got uh, a three TC mutation, and uh, another uh, the is the P two two five H. Is that on your uh, friends list for Duraverine? It is. Uh, again, I think that P two two five with the integrase inhibitor shouldn't be there, but um, yeah, that's one of those Duraverine associated mutations. The five that came out in the drive trials. I see. Okay, protease looks pretty clean. Um, I think sequinavir is the main one, the most affected by L10. I have my dusty memory going back into cobwebs in my head re recalls, but um, so, and then integrase inhibitor? 263K is, is the- um, Dagger. When we, look, when we look at people who have selected resistance on dolotegravir and, and now, you know, a few cases of Bictegravir, this one is the one that pops up the most commonly. Yeah, so that's a that's a pretty significant one. So with that as background- what I wanna say about the R263K, uh, cause I just, again, keep on looking back at the trials and saying, I know what they said in vitro passages would come out to predict um, a resistance to a medication, but it was really when you put a drug with experienced patients with resistance, like in the Viking study with Dolotegravir, that you truly see what comes out that predicts resistance to that drug. And Bictegravir is a very, has a very high genetic barrier to resistance. It came out in 2018. So we were actually waiting for data, not from the in vitro zero passage data, um, but waiting for data to see if you had some sort of NRTI mutation with Bictarv, what is going to end up coming out that predicts Bictegravir resistance. And you're gonna talk about that, but, but we needed, I think two or three years on with Bictegravir to see what was going to end up coming out because we it's it's a very high genetic brain resistance drug and it wasn't studied in very treatment experienced patients. Right. Well, the good news is it doesn't happen that often, but when it does, it's it's a it's a dagger. So with that as background, let's see what people would do. So here are your choices. Um, you can see them up there. Uh, go ahead and ponder and vote. Again, the principle we're looking at here is at least two active drugs. But we're in a situation with somebody who uses crystal meth. So the more complicated the regimen, the least likely it's gonna be taken. That's the conundrum, isn't it? Okay, let's see what we got. All right, kind of all over the map. Carrie, what were you thinking as you looked at this case? I think I, um, I was kind of split between option one and option two, trying to think about, okay, what's, what's best case scenario, what's practical. I think that um, I probably would have gone with one or two, probably two <laughs> with the twice a day Delhi Tegravir. But again, I'm not sure. Yeah. You can make a good argument that one is good enough if he takes it, but that's really the, the key determinant is the intermittent adherence. Um, just want to say that, uh, that, that the key, the key thing that 
the case brings out is the importance of adherence, especially in people with some degree of background resistance already. I feel okay and pretty good in a way about one. And the reason is that I totally agree that it would have been best to have a integrase inhibitor in here with it. And you're right, the big is out because we can't be ID it, but we do have this BID data from Viking for dolotegravir. But on the other hand, if you fail um, with uh, adherence difficulties on, on the brand name Sumtuza, that Drunavir Kobe Top FTC, you usually still don't lose that Drunavir. It is, it is pretty great in terms of a high genetic barrier resistance. So I feel like we could go for a while and that once a day could, do, could really be the push that allows them to do it. Yeah. Well, I was taken by the um, adherence issues. And while I think um, in the ideal world, if everybody took everything prescribed to them, <laughs> option two would have the best shot at, at working, the, as, as we said. I think option one would probably work just on its own. You give it that extra boost, then that would probably do so. And deraverine, um, even though there's that one mutation, it probably would be okay. Maraviroc, we aren't using nearly as much. There's a lot of drug interactions that we'd have to work through and, uh, and we didn't check for tropism. It's, it's starting to, as the number of patients are decreasing with this challenge and deraverine and some other drugs, Fostemzivir are coming up. I think we're gonna use less and less Maraviroc, but um, it seems like we're leaning towards uh, option one like the audience did. And in the Emerald City, people really did have like M1A4Bs and some people even had K65Rs and they had they, this kind of background. They were, already, they were already suppressed. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, so, okay. I, mean, I, th I think actually, just since you, you mentioned Emerald, uh, the, the data on switching to either dolutegravir plus tenofovir FTC or bictegravir or tenofovir FTC and suppressed patients with 184V historically are very strong. Yeah. It's, di it's different from viremic patients, but suppressed yeah, yeah, yeah. patients. Well, that's, yeah. yeah, it's more back to the first case in a backhanded way. Yeah. Okay. Um, Monica, this was a slide that you, we already talked about the, the dagger of R263K, but um, we can probably just, if it's okay, uh, uh, share this with the audience because it's kind of too hard to read. But I think that that was a take home point, right? I think just to put it simply, um, we it does have a high genetic barrier resistance. We had to kind of wait for things to fail. And um, on all five of these cases, these are all published and then we have one in our clinic as well. Uh, there was a preceding M184V um, or I, and then a continuation of BIC, TAF, FTC. And so maybe if you've lost the FTC um, and then you just have the tenofovir with the BIC, um, and then poor adherence on top of it, which occurred with all of these patients, mm -hmm. that's when you set the stage for a uh, bictegravir associated mutation to evolve and failure subsequently. And it was that R263K that came out. So I'm beginning to think of this as a signature mutation for bictegravir. Yeah. So go ahead, Paul. Yeah. So I'm the, uh, this, uh, I want to mention the first author on the OFID paper because she's become very famous in the COVID-19 world. And she and she and I collaborated on this project before COVID nineteen actually hit, and then uh, she continued to work on it as it was the pandemic was evolving, and so she ended up publishing the paper. Most of these are dolotegravir failures, so yeah. Yeah. so it's dol dolotegravir and bictegravir are behaving almost identically in in clinical practice. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So I have a question, I guess, thinking if we could rewind time a little bit, ideally get this patient the social support they need as well. Could he have been a candidate previously for something like cabotegravir, cabotegravir and ropivirine? If that might have helped, you know, for someone with difficulty adhering to all of these pills and follow-ups, I think there's probably pros and cons, and I'm not sure how that fits in with this new R263K mutation. I think that's such a great question. The, the FLARE trial did not allow in anything but K103Ns um, for preceding NNRTI resistance and ATLAS didn't re allow any 
uh, proceeding in an RTI resistance, but you could argue that this patient has a K103N and that's totally fine with ropivirine. It does have the P225H, um, so that will reduce ropivirine a bit though. Um, and then second is the cabotegravir question is such a good one because I keep on looking at Atlas 2M, 16 failures, and then the Atlas Flare put together eight failures. And in all of those, um, our, it wasn't, it was this kind of L74I, which comes along with the, the HIV type A um, that we learned a lot about um, a couple years ago, Croy from Russia, but it doesn't, doesn't mean that that's the only polymorphism that matters, but that was the one that keeps on coming out. And R2, uh, R263K did not emerge as a failure mutation with cabotegravir, and that was 2M was just published in December in Lancet, and it was really helpful to see just the L74 come out. So I wonder if cabotegravir would be active against the R263K. They each have their own peculiar mutations. And I don't think our 263K, I hope, well, let's wait for the cabotegravir data from HP10083 right. at Croy. But if that doesn't end up coming out, maybe you can use it. Well, I really think, oh, go ahead. Is it that there were, no, there were no failures allowed in any of the pivotal cabotegravir rolpivirine studies. Yeah. And he had already failed a regimen. So he doesn't fit the criteria. Yeah, so we That's have, true. We, we're going to have to watch. Carrie, is there anything else coming in from the Q&A? Uh, yeah, there are some great questions here. Actually, I was just um, looking at one and going to pose this to the group. What if a patient can't take protease inhibitors because they're about to go through hepatitis C treatment or just any other medication, drug-drug interactions? What other options do we have? I've been seeing some more um, acute hep C trend, uh, transmissions lately, actually, thinking of that. Yeah. I think there's another question in there that I think plays into that. And that is, if we're going to treat for hep C, we, somehow or another, we're going to have to address the crystal meth because mm -hmm. uh, that's going to get in the way. And, and that's the hardest part of the whole, that's kind of the, the underlying under, if, if, if we find a way to successfully um, refer the patient to some rehab facility or change things up, that that's a game changer for all of this. Right. Um, so I think that's the first point, although that's difficult. Um, uh, it's extremely difficult. Uh, but, uh, you know, we could, there are other agents just thinking out loud, the, the deraverine seemed like it might be there and I'd have to look back and see about drug interactions with HCV therapies. Um, other thoughts from the panel? This Can't, is going to are temporary, like Maravarak, or, you know, this is going to be a temporary regimen to get them off the Ritonavir, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. One thing I did want to say, because there was a great question on Darunavir, Ritonavir, Dolotegavir, BID, is that's a fair point, is that Dualis was just published. I do recognize that people are virologically suppressed um, uh, in Dualis as well, to switch over to Darunavir boosted plus Dolotegavir, but it is a regimen that often is used if you don't, if you need to get off the TAFFTC for some reason. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Um, so this is the high grade resistance situation. So uh, similar in a way that this is a guy who has had meth use. And like a lot of times we get a transfer in either from another city or another clinic. And the guy comes in initially with a CD4 less than 20, a high viral load. Um, had a prior exposure to many drugs, basically um, PIs and several different types of nukes. Um, and, and about a year before his arrival, he had success with um, uh, dolutegravir and ropivirine, but now is not doing real well. And the week, in the couple of weeks before, he was hospitalized, had a viral load of a million, and to the dolutegravir ropivirine. TAF FTC was added. So now he's coming in after the hospitalization on the regimen of dolutegravir, ropivirine, TAF FTC. And this is kind of the summary. Uh, he got changed to darunavir, COBE, 3TC, and dolutegravir twice a day. Uh, and the viral load came down, but did not go to undetectable. So uh, this feels a little different than that first case where we were hovering between 60 and 85. This is well above 200. So, Paul, what do you think when you see this? 
um, very concerned. And yes. this, this is the, uh, you know, it's so, so striking how that 200 number, you know, people can be low level viremic between 50 and 100, 50, even 150 for a long time. But then as soon as you get up around 200 or above, this really is replicating virus and selection of more resistance. So, so this is the bottom half of that circle yeah. where the antiretroviral therapy uh, is a little bit porous. Um, yeah. There's some de novo replication, which to Monica's point at the very beginning, that's what the worry is, is that and there then, could be. Right, and you had, and you had the thing about dolotegavir or pivirine, which you know, really has kind of like a niche use in people who somehow can't be on tenofovir or lamivudine. You know, so often people with severe renal insufficiency, uh, but, but most people who are poorly adherent, it's not a good drug strategy for them because they have to take it with food and repivirine has this so-so resist, terrible actually resistance barrier. And, um, and then if you leave the dolotegavir without another active drug, you get dolotegavir resistance. So. And, and the higher viral load at baseline. Which, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So definitely. Okay. So Monica, this was in your camp somewhere nearby. Um, uh, what did you all think? I should go maybe to the resistance. Here we go. This is gives it away that it's from California. <laughs> <laughs> what did you all um, think when you saw that? These are, these are the Viking failures. Yeah, so so K65R and M184V in the NNR in the NRTIs. So both, so we do have that. Um, like sometimes you'd have to use ATT in this case, but but tenofovir is 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 gone, and then the NNRTIs um, we have a rolpivirine mutation E138, um, and then Y181 that reduces lots, but a travarine as well, um, and those are the two that I'm concerned about. And then INST E138 um, also is an INST associated mutation of concern. So is 97. So is G140 and Q148, and the Q148 specifically because we had that advantage in Viking to say, okay, which one, if you like added dolotegavir, almost monotherapy, because there was so much resistance to NNRTIs, NNRTIs and PIs and Viking, so with optimized background regimen and you added dolotegavir with monotherapy, it did, it did actually hold together the regimen pretty well at 73% suppression, unless you, had a, unless you had a Q148, usually with two other mutations. But the Q148 and G140, I think of as hanging out by the corner with cigarettes. Like these are not, this is not a good pair uh, for dolotegavir. <laughs> um, and right. so I really worry about dolotegavir with that. Yeah, and here the phenotype sort of confirms what you're saying. Um, the dravarine looks attractive. Zidovudine, you know, if you had to pull out a drug, it, it's a horrible drug to tolerate, but um, this is because of the K65R pathway at least conceptually, there would be an option. Um, nobody's yeah. using stabidine much. So let's go to our choices. Um, complicated, let everybody sort of study it for a little bit, see what you think. You've heard commentary about um, uh, the dolutegravir, the TAF or tenofovir. Um, it's a tough, tough call. FTR, by the way, is fostemzavir, as you're looking through that as an option. Uh, it's a, we'll talk about it in a second. So let's go ahead and see what the audience thought. All right, it's, it's a, this is a hard, hard case. Um, but most people are staying with the principles of active drugs. So the fostemzavir, new drug, different mechanism of action. Duravarine, we saw probably had activity. And then staying away from tenofovir with a boosted darunavir seems pretty reasonable to me. What, what, is the, what does the crowd think uh, on the panel here? I think there's questions in the Q&A now and actually the pre-session questions, a lot of interest in when to use fostemzavir, when, you know, when should we start reaching for this medication and, and practically how can we get it to help our patients? Could I ask Paul a question about this? So there was this, with Big Tegravir, this case report of um, a patient who I think it slipped through the, the <clears throat> switch studies 
who actually had a G140, a Q148 and a G140. Um, those are my least favorite. And um, followed for like 115 weeks and did great on Victegrader. So that, I know it's just one case report, but it was given the R263K is what's coming out with Victegrader, that case report had always stuck in my mind that Victegrader could be a PI that um, is okay against the Q148 and G140 together. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's not on here, but of the choices, if you needed to use a NSTE, I wondered what Paul thought about that. So that, that case uh, was discovered in retrospectively by going back to the baseline Victegravir enrollees and looking for integrase resistance. And um, what I would suspect happened is that, and I don't have this information, was that that patient had a relatively low viral load. And so by having TAF-FTC fully active and having Victegravir maybe a little active, that they, they were able to achieve suppression. Because remember, two drugs sometimes can do it. You know, in the initial studies of dual nucleosides, you have uh, some people who get suppressed with dual nucleosides. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I wouldn't expect any activity of Bictegravir in this, okay. this uh, combination. So with that in mind, it feels like this is uh, the audience's view of, uh, it looked like, so we didn't have much in protease uh, resistance. So the Runivir is in most every regimen. And then it's a question of what do you pair it with? So Fostimzavir should have activity, Duravirine, should have some. So option six is a little bit of maybe even overkill. The three TCs along for the ride because of, of a crouton, I call it. The salad's leaving the, the, the kitchen, you throw a couple of croutons on as it leaves. It has a little bit of activity, maybe 0 0.5, 0 0.5, but it's the, you know, bam, as it leaves the, as it leaves the kitchen. Um, not necessary maybe, but you know, what's a little three TC among friends. Um, so, um, Thoughts? Extra pill, though. Yeah. So, Paul, any uh, your no, I think I think this is a good use of Fostemzavir and Darunavir Kobe. I would uh, again just caution all of our, you know, use of Duravirine in these people with extensive NNRTI resistance is really uh, at this point the case report level. Um, there's been very little formal study of Duravirine in this regard because the study, studies were treatment naive studies and switch without resistance and just a few isolated cases of people being treated with transmitted NRTI resistance. So, yep. Okay. Uh, Carrie, questions from the audience or? Yeah, there was a great point brought up by someone in the audience. You know, I think we, many of us practice here within the U.S., but many people don't. So thinking internationally, what would we do if we didn't have access to Fostemzavir and Ibilizumab? Would we feel comfortable just doing something like option three, potentially, given so our discussion? There's a decent chance that darunavir kobe ftc TAF as a single pill would work in this patient. When you look back at the um, people who failed first-line NNRTI treatments, in globally, uh, and then went on to the second line studies that included lopinavir, ritonavir, plus recycled nucleosides. Many of them had K65R and 184V, and they still suppressed. So uh, I would say there's probably a 70 to 80% chance that just darunavir kobe ftc TAF would, would work. And, and it might be that even though the drugs are approved in the US and a few other countries, um, they, they might be available through compassionate use, but that's our expanded access or the equivalent. It's just a little harder. Paul, I may turn to you, if you don't mind, to walk us through these couple of data slides, just introducing people to Fostemzavir. And yeah, sure. Fostemzavir is this, uh, this you know, inhibits C C CD4 binding with, the, with HIV by this mechanism. Just think of it like an attachment inhibitor. Um, and it's, it's got antiviral activity uh, clearly shown, and in, in this is a, a, a monotherapy study. Um, and it's pretty potent, a little more than a log decline. And then uh, if you go on to the next studies, this is a bright study, this is an animated slide. This is a decent sized study of treatment experience patients. And they actually had two different groups that they enrolled. They had the group that had actually other active drugs. And then they had a group that had really no active drugs. And we'll see the results if you keep going forward. Uh, if you see the, the people in the randomized cohort, these are the people with the active drugs. They actually uh, had a little phase of Fostemzavir monotherapy, and then they optimized the background and 70% achieved viral suppression, less than 200. And then even more impressively, it's small numbers, the 38 patients with really no other active drugs still 
you know, uh, 40% of them had viral suppression. So fostemsevir has been tested in patients with a lot with limited treatment options more than any of our other drugs. So that's encouraging news. Yeah. Let's talk about, yeah. yeah. But it is twice a day. And so for the patient- Twice a day, twice a day. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, ibalizumab- is, and also very few drug-drug interactions. Sorry. Ibalizumab like, so is, this, uh, is this monoclonal antibody that actually, um, when my uh, division chief, Dan Karitskis, was recruited from Colorado, he came to Boston in 2002, I think, and he says, we've got this very exciting drug. It's an infusional monoclonal antibody named something like Tanax 102 or something like that. And so ibalizumab has been around for a long time, and it actually does have antiviral activity by, again, another attachment inhibitor. And it's, it's given as an IV infusion um, every two weeks. And it's very well tolerated. Uh, so there aren't people who develop allergies to it or anything. It takes about 15 minutes to go in. Infusion centers do it very comfortably. Um, I've had a few people on this who had no other options, people with congenital HIV who have you know, gone through everything and now they're suppressed on, on nebulizumab plus other drugs. And the actual study that got it licensed is not li uh, referenced on this uh, slide. It's a New England Journal of Medicine paper with about 35 patients but it did show that it had antiviral activity and then combined with a background regimen, you could get about half the people suppressed, uh, even if they had incredibly few options. Um, some of these many of these patients in these studies had no uh, integrase inhibitor activities. So yeah. it's been around now for a couple of years. And it's relatively inexpensive, I understand. <laughs> You're joking. Of course. It's yeah, extremely so, expensive. This yeah. has got almost orphan drug status costs. So. Yeah. It's yeah, so it's what about a hundred and ten thousand dollars for a year's worth of yeah. dosing. Yeah, I mean, so so a way to look at the cost of ibalizumab uh, is that it is uh, a lot per patient, but very little in the uh, in the um, in the ADAP pharmacy budget because so few people are on it. Yeah, Carrie, any uh, comments uh, from the audience or uh, from you? There's been, yeah, a couple uh, good comments. One just came in about, um, I'm not exactly sure related to ibalizumab, but kind of taking into account linkage of mutations. I think this is what Monica was um, referencing earlier and which ones are likely or unlikely to kind of be related to each other. And I think that goes hand in hand with when we might need to think of some of these more um, advanced or newer treatment options yeah. or bright ideas. Wow. And I'm so sorry, I just dismissed a study I, a, a, a question, I was trying to answer it, uh, writing, but the Dualis study, it was D-U-A-L-I-S. Um, so just published in December, I think, November. Um, and uh, I can just, I'm just gonna put right now the, uh, the and, link in the chat. Paul, coming back to these two drugs, uh, since they're both working roughly at the level of attachment and entry, is there synergy in the? So it did appear in the uh, in the Bright study that people who were on both fostemsevir and ibalizumab may have done better, and that's probably because they had either they weren't antagonistic at least. So, yeah. okay. Well, we have time for our last case here, which um, trying to improve adherence without relying on pill taking behavior. So there are some patients who just don't want to take a pill, or they can't, or there's a situation. So this is one of, uh, I modified from, from one of Paul Sachs's cases of a 46 year old uh, woman who was diagnosed a while back um, and uh, had been through basically most every drug, including in Fuvertide, T20 at some point, um, has had a lot of GI trouble, candida esophagitis, a number of things, some neurologic things that I just uh, went past, but, focusing on the antiretroviral therapy um, on regimens that should have been pretty easy to take, but still a lot of missed doses. And um, there's no resistance, at least on a genotype back then and up here. So uh, mostly doesn't take the other pills. So the question then is, is there something here that we could do um, that is longer acting and um, go ahead and vote if you think there's something there that looks attractive. Either liquid formulation alone is option four. Just keep pushing on the single tablet BIC. Um, and is cabotegravir 
propivirine comes out, is that an option? Would you add something to that? And if so, why? And then of course the old every day, some other option. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see what we got. All right, so vast majority, definite majority goes with an injectable. And then some people went with an injectable plus ibilizumab, uh, those who had a very unlimited budget. And uh, there's a few people who, uh, who follow the adage of uh, if, you kept, if you keep trying something that didn't work, you keep trying it. Um, there are other names for that. Futility is one, but there's other harsher descriptions. So um, Monica, this is a new case to you. Um, what strikes you in this lady who sort of keeps her visits, it sounds like, but just doesn't take the medicine while at home? Yeah, I mean, um, so I, I actually have this exact same uh, patient in my practice who, who is female and, and it's uh, something to do with the pills for her. Um, it makes her so anxious uh, to take a pill. Uh, and uh, um, so what happened, I mean, I have these, again, this exact same thing. I put her on Victaf FTC. I gave her a little bribery to take the pills um, and she ended up evolving in M184V. Um, and uh, now I'm stuck with a big TAF FTC with an M184V with poor adherence, just like going back to our old uh, concerns that this is the person who could get an R263K. So I actually just put her on Drunavir Kobe TAF FTC and uh, she can't take it. She simply can't take it. So I am waiting with bated breath. The FDA just approved, of course, or authorized, sorry, a cabotegavir ropivirine. Um, I, I, uh, very recently, January 26, I think, but but uh, it's still not on our formularies uh, for, for the particular insurance that she has, ADAP and also Medicaid, uh, Medi-Cal, Medicaid out here. Um, so I am waiting uh, for this injectable uh, and I am okay uh, with cabotegravir and ropivirine. I don't, um, she again does not have any NSD mutations. She does not have any uh, ropivirine mutations. I do recognize she is not the person who was allowed into Flare and Atlas. They had to actually both be virologically suppressed, um, often on dolotegravir or back of her 3TC for a long time before you ended up getting put on your injectable. So they're not for virologically unsuppressed patients. I'm okay with um, that. And she's not going to be able to come in every two weeks for an infusion. I think she'll be able to come in every four weeks for an injection. And I am uh, waiting for that. And uh, I will give her incentives um, for her cabotegravir pivoting injections. And then my question is going to be, when can I go to eight weeks? But right now it's only approved for every four weeks. Yeah. I have a question for you. Would you try to get her suppressed before starting real pivoting cabotegravir? I have tried Even some over, I've literally known her since 2005. I, she has a CD4 count of um, 62. I have tried for 16 years and I cannot. Yeah. Um, so no, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to. And it really is a refractory issue with the pill taking, just the putting the pill in the mouth. What, what about the liquid uh, option four? Because you can get dalutegravir as a tablet that can be dispersed and created into a slurry and it makes her HIV real to put something in her mouth. It's just, oh. a, it's a particular aspect of my relationship with this oh, patient. So, I, I mean, this isn't your patient, but, but this is what it is for her. I and so I, I, I just know that I can, I have been waiting uh, for years for this injectable regimen. So this, this, there's, there's a lot of concern about the use of uh, dolotegravir, I'm sorry, cabotegravir or pivirin injectable in less adherent patients, which is why the ACDG is doing a study which has this upfront incentives to get suppression and then switch. And even there, we have very little mid experience, but, but treating of viremic patients uh, is, is a concern. And I would just put a pitch in for number three because uh, the, the ability to have additional help with the well, pivirine in particular, that's, the, that's what I think mm -hmm. I worry the most about, uh, the PK of injectable ropivirine and the low resistance barrier of ropivirine. And you know, we, we kind of know that a predictor of cabotegravir resistance is ropivirine resistance mutations. So I'm, that's, uh, I, I, would, I would think this is a potential use for this very expensive but, but little used drug, ibilizumab, to get this uh, case 
Our yeah. lower. And, 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 and the details matter, don't they? Because in, in Monica's case, the, the patient, um, it, it's really not an issue of not taking the pills because of any other reason that it's a reminder. So if she is comfortable coming into clinic, assuming you can get it under control, but maybe start with embolizumab and get it down and then you can drift away from that. Uh, I don't know. But uh, the, the other thing that the reason I show this slide is that if several doses are missed, um, they don't, they fail to show up, that creates a potential problem for the real pivoting for sure, but ultimately for the cabotegravir as well. So um, Carrie, one of the things that our docs and especially our administrators are concerned about is uh, we're busy clinic, you're a busy clinic, we're all busy clinics. Now we're going to, if we put people on this, we're going to have to set up an entire new infrastructure. Right. How are you dealing with that in New York? That is a great question. And actually, Monica, just discussing her case, reminded me of a patient I was seeing who kind of transiently couldn't take pills because of oral pharyngeal cancer. He had an HPV associated base of tongue cancer. And I really was thinking, you know, what could I do in this short term? Uh, can we crush, you know, which tablets can be crushed? And it kind of was a basic question that led me down this road to think of what other options we have. Um, in terms of the infrastructure, I'm not sure I can speak to that yet, but I think theoretically, if someone, you know, was getting doses of cabotegravir and pivarine and, and some of my patients with adherence issues, I had thought about for like A5359, what if they don't come back? And then they're left with a tail of slowly downdrifting medication levels, you know, is that really going to stoke the flames of resistance? Yeah. Sure. She couldn't even go into 5359 because she couldn't take the, uh, the world. Oh, mm. Yeah. Mm. No, well, this is, oh, yeah, go ahead, Paul. No, I was just going to say that, that, that th this is version one of long acting injectable cabropivirine. It'll be great for adherent patients. They love it. Uh, but it's it, pushing the envelope with it is, is going to be tricky and probably going to have some, some lessons learned that are going to be tough. So. Yeah. And there are new drugs coming along, right? Uh, capsid inhibitors and, and uh, Islatrovir and others sure. that, that'll, that, as you said, this is a first generation. We're almost out of time. I'm going to kick it back uh, to Carrie, but I'll finish with this summary that we always want to confirm the virologic failure, explore prior resistance and regimens. We said that kind of quickly, but that's a fundamental two active drugs, if possible, more if, if you can, uh, twice daily for dalutegravir if there's um, resistance to it and bictegravir. Uh, generally speaking, tenofovir is in the mix, but unless there's a K65R like we saw, boosted darunavir has a role even when there's some degree of resistance. Um, as I mentioned, uh, 3TC or FTC is a crouton. And then when you have availability and you need it, isolibumab and fostemzavir. And Carrie, I'll turn it back over to you for any final questions or comments. Sure, I guess perhaps in the interest of time, we could end on a high note. There's a comment from the audience um, that the customized trial is looking at implementation, how to kind of optimize delivery to patients. And I guess that should be presented soon, looking at real world use. So that's kind of a, a bright spot. Um, I think some other takeaways really just focus around kind of patient-centered care, trying to avoid these situations by supporting people to take their medications the best they can in the first place, and then being there to help them with whatever burdens remain. Yeah. So maybe- We are starting maybe. a shot clinic though, where we go in and out with our, hopefully for our cabotegravir, no waiting at the front desk. You like get met by this person and then you go back to the LVN, they give you the shot. Yeah. And we're also gonna pilot self-injection because it is in the hip. I keep, right. I, you can't see me pointing to that, but that's possible. We did a little, Yeah. Oof. We it's not sub Q, it's I am, but I, but it's gonna be a I hard the one. volume was fairly it's gonna be large. a trial. It's quite a bit of volume, but we think I, there's some people who could wow. Wow. It's a it's a it's in the context of a trial. Okay. Right. <laughs> um I, I need to go back and share my screen. Sorry, just briefly to get to the post-test questions. Uh so I, I'd skipped over that. Sorry. Uh, real quickly, um, here we go. Uh question one is the same one we asked before. Let's see. If anybody was paying attention to that very first couple of slides, I'll give you a three count, three, two, one. Let's see what we got. Yay. 
Okay, that's what the data showed. And the next question, uh, it, the first part's just a reiteration. The question is how many active drugs do you ideally want at a minimum? Um, and let's go ahead and vote. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yay, 96%, perfect. All right, we, we did, we uh, at least uh, got answers that were consistent with what we said. So I guess that's good. The only thing I was going to say, Carrie, before you wrap up is that we're, we've determined that we're going to have to hire at least two people to manage cabotegravir if we're going to use it in any meaningful way. And, and, and then maybe even a third person to track the people who don't show and <laughs> getting them in. And so it is going to be um, a commitment on the part of the clinic on top of all the other stuff we do. But for those in whom it works, it's, it's, a, it's a nice option and hopefully injectables and implantables will change over the next three to five years. So I'll let you wrap up. Sure, yeah, it certainly may be a, a paradigm shift in our, in our care. Um, all right, well, I guess thank you everyone for your attention today. There were so many excellent questions and comments in the Q&A. I tried to kind of pull in and synthesize as many as I could. Um, perhaps if we leave it open a bit, direct answers could be I'll put in after the session. I'm, I'm not sure if that's possible, but thank you everybody for the participation. All right. Thanks. And an evaluation will be sent out yep. in an email. Thank you, Dr. Johnston. And that information will be available to attendees by 5 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow. And this will enable us to review all of those that attended today's live broadcast. A list of upcoming webinars and how to sign up is available on the ISUSA website. And next week, we'll be hosting another webinar panel discussion with the ISUSA board and moderator, Dr. Nadine Caslow. Here are our upcoming courses, which registration is also available on the website. And our upcoming dialogue is available as well for sign up and our on demand dialogue from the past month are also available on the website. Again, we'd like to thank our moderator, Dr. Johnston, and our panel members, Dr. Gandhi, Sag, and Sachs, and to the audience for your participation. This concludes today's webinar. <laughs>